I'll let you know once we're live. <laughs> cool. By the way, Hardeep, so it seems as I don't need to share, right? Because it's already here. Uh, you do you need to share your presentation, share your screen. I'm already seeing it. I, know. I think we're it's probably. Live, guys. Sorry? <laughs> we're live. Ah, okay, great. <clears throat> Does this mean that all of the attendees have joined? Because I can't, usually you're able yes, to see. Yes, so we're them. not going to be able to see them in the meeting room. Everyone is actually going to be seeing the video on YouTube. Okay, so we're live now. Okay, great. Okay. Yes. Right, should we kick off? Or should we wait a couple of seconds? I'd say maybe wait till dot on 12. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I guess that outlook reminder means that it's 12 now, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, so first of all, uh, welcome everyone. Um, today, in the next hour, we'd like to spend some time with you uh, to speak about uh, consulting and about Roland Berger. Uh, we'd like to make this this uh, uh, and as interactive as, as, as possible session. Um, so we'll start off with a, with a bit of introduction and then uh, you know, a couple of things about the company, uh, about the way uh, we'd like to work, what we stand for, uh, and also what the recruiting process looks like. But we'd like to spend the majority of the time actually to uh, you know, answer your questions and go deeper into the topics you're interested in. Uh, so feel free to, to drop your questions in, uh, in the chat box um, and then we can pick them up, prioritize and, uh, uh, and answer them. All right. Um, so yeah, be part of, of the journey, right? The journey of Roland Berger. Um, maybe to start off with the, uh, with the introductions first. Um, my name is Kai Balder. I'm a partner uh, in our London office. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by education. Um, I started back in our Amsterdam office uh, 11 years ago, more than 11 years ago. Um, then after four years, I did a, a one and a half year transfer to London, which um, escalated a bit given seven years later, I'm still here. <laughs> um, I predominantly uh, work in like engineering heavy industries. Uh, so in aerospace, in defense and electronics. Uh, but also in, in life sciences. And that covers like quite broadly the life sciences space. So healthcare, but also pharma and, and for instance, diagnostics. Um, so very interesting space, particularly in, in, in this time, obviously. Um, and yeah, uh, Alexei, maybe you can, you can say a few words as well. Hey, Kai. Yeah, hi, my name is Alexei. Um, I've been working for Roland Berger for three years now. I joined straight after uni. I basically had an internship uh, directly after my final year and then joined uh, a couple of weeks later and I've been working for RB London ever since. I mainly have been working in the private equity space, helping with investor relations. And I think over the last three years, I've also managed to travel around the RB offices a bit, <laughs> working in Chicago for about a month and working in Munich for about a month. Uh, I think I'll hand over to Nikhil if you... Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Alexi. Um, so my name is Nikhil Sarsteva. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a project manager at RB London. Um, I'm actually also an engineer by training um, and started my, uh, started my career at RB in Boston following my MBA at the Harvard Business School. Um, now I work in predominantly the aerospace sector, uh, but also do a fair amount of work in, in, in industries like aviation and automotive. And with that, I'll hand over to Capucine. Yeah, sure. Uh, so my name is Capucine. Very pleased to be here today. Um, I joined Roland Berger a little more than one year ago. I used to be an intern here. Um, I'm still a generalist, I would say. I usually work on private equity projects. I'm very interested in any topic related to consumer goods and to ESG. 
and maybe sustainability issues in general, I can say. Uh, prior to this, I studied management in a French business school and yeah, I look forward to our session today. Sam, I guess. Uh, thanks, Kempsey. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Sam. I'm also a junior consultant here in the London office. Uh, I've joined Roland Berger almost exactly one year ago, so in October last year. Um, since then, I've been working on a range of projects uh, in the private equity space, uh, in aviation and aerospace, um, and a few other bits uh, in and around automotive. Um, prior to that, I studied uh, material science, so and also um, engineering type background. Um, I'll pass you over to Lucas to introduce himself as well. Lucas, you're on mute. <laughs> Hi everyone, sorry. Yeah. Hi, sorry. Uh, so I, I've joined uh, Roland Berger a bit less uh, than a year ago, uh, so in January. So um, over the period of time, I had opportunity to work on uh, private equity projects, uh, sustainability projects, and did a bit of so of uh, aerospace and defense work. So I'm still uh, looking into everything that uh, RB London can do. Um, prior to this, I did uh, my studies in uh, in France in business school as well, similar to Capucine, and I completed this by a year uh, of studies in London. Uh, and I'm still uh, looking forward to discovering all this and meeting you all today. So I'm going to pass on to Hardeep. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name's Hardeep and I'm the HR manager in the London office. Um, I joined Roland Berger just over a year ago now and i um, looking forward to connecting with you all and guiding you through our application process. I'll pass you over to Veronica. Hi everyone, my name is Veronica, I'm an HR specialist in Roland Berger. I joined around March and I'm part of Hardeep's team and I'm here to answer all the questions that you may have recruitment wise. Over to you, Hardeep. Thank you. I'm actually going to hand over to Kai now to kickstart the Roland Berger introduction. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. Um, so on to the next slide be part of our story. Um, and I guess our story really started with uh, with our founder, right? Uh, Roland Berger. Um, he's still alive. Uh, we tend to refer to him as Holy Roly. <laughs> um, but he, he he is truly so like the embodiment, I think, of entrepreneurship. We'll, we'll speak a bit about entrepreneurship uh, later on as well when we when we touch upon our values. Uh, but in 1967, he he founded um, this a uh, one man firm in Munich, basically. Before that, he had already had uh, a couple of interesting um, and very profitable businesses, I think in laundry services and, you know, all kinds of different uh, areas. Uh, and he, he taught himself basically how to run a business and then figured out like, okay, you know, I can, I can actually apply those learnings for other businesses and other people as well. And, and that's when he founded uh, Roland Berger, um, named after himself, uh, as a one-man firm in Munich. Um, then after two years already, he started with the first international office in Milan. Um, and, you know, th that, that started going quite well. After three years already, he had 100 employees um, and also started to move out uh, to, to Brazil, Sao Paulo. Uh, and I think the really sort of like big growth in the company um, has been driven to a large extent, I think, by the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Um, and I think it's an interesting story to spend some time in and also tells you a bit about our profile. Um, so when the Berlin Wall fell, there were many Eastern German state-owned companies uh, that were performing really, really badly. So many of those companies have been placed into uh, a foundation called the Treuhandanstalt. And uh, basically all those uh, former uh, state-owned East German companies were being restructured. Um, and we've been restructuring about a third of that portfolio, right? So a third of the Eastern Germany, uh, German state-owned companies. Uh, and by doing that, we created an, uh, like an industrial methodology almost of restructuring a company, which is why we're like very, very well known and best known, um, at least on the continent, uh, for restructuring. And that is one of our key competences um, and also has after that driven our growth, right? So in France, for instance, we started restructuring uh, and then, you know, started building other industries. And that office is now, I think, three to 400 consultants. 
So, so that has really driven. So like, that's when the, the big growth has taken off in the 1990s. Obviously, it's not just only firm driven, but also market driven because, you know, that's when, you know, the internet started and you, know, you didn't need to go to a library anymore as a consultant. Uh, you could make slides on PowerPoint rather than that you had to cut them out in transparencies and things like that, right? So there were also many like technological factors. Um, so large growth, then early 2000s, we entered into the US um, and uh, so offices there in, in Detroit and Boston and Chicago, uh, which are rapidly growing uh, as we speak, actually. Um, and uh, yeah, in 2015, uh, we it's like revamped uh, the strategy. Uh, we very recently did that as well, but we'll touch upon that later on on, on sustainability. Um, to really look at uh, not only the knowledge that we've been applying always, but also technology and capital. Um, and uh, all of those points we'll cover in, in a sec. So if we move on um, to the next slide, uh, just a, a bit of a footprint, right, uh, uh, of our company. So uh, about two and a half thousand employees. 75% um, of what we do is typically international collaboration. Um, 52 offices among 35 countries, 60 nationalities, right? So there's a lot of uh, diversity in here. And I think that also is like one of the things that sets us apart from other large consulting firms. We are the only global consultancy with European roots, right? That are used to um, uh, this diversity, basically, uh, across countries, across cultures, um, and make that work, right? So we are very much more focused, I think, on a stakeholder value than shareholder value, right? Which many of our uh, uh, US-based um, uh, competitors uh, have. Um, then moving on, <clears throat> just to spend a little bit of time on our values, right? And, and the way we work. Um, and basically we have three values, all starting with an E, entrepreneurship, empathy, and excellence. And I think all three are key to our work um and 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 the way we do our work right and let's start with entrepreneurship uh because i think that this is the one that really sets us apart so i think as i've described uh roland you know very entrepreneurial individual and that entrepreneurship has always been the dna of our firm um and there are many many different examples of this but one of my favorite examples is uh, a junior consultant that joined us in amsterdam who was like a massive football fan and he said, you know, I just want to do a project for a football club. Uh, and so he was like two or three months in. So in his spare time, he started preparing pitches for football clubs and things they could do. Um, you know, then, you know, went to a partner who liked football as well. And he's like, you know, I have this idea. So your partner's like, okay, I like this. Great. You know, uh, they started developing the idea, started improving it, started pitching it. And like six or seven months later, they were doing a project for a football club, right? Uh, that guy spoke to another guy running a football club. They did another one and they just like kept going, right? Uh, and in the end, there was this massive restructuring case they did for Borussia Dortmund um, that then, you know, afterwards started winning trophies as well. Uh, so I think that's just a, a great example of, you know, entrepreneurship and also what we try to nurture. Um, so the hierarchy is flat, right? Uh, if you have a great idea, great ideas don't have any hierarchy. Uh, if you have a great idea, it doesn't matter who you are, um, just, you know, discuss it with the company management and, and get going if it's a great idea. So that's entrepreneurship. Uh, and I think something very much um, part of our DNA and also I think something for you to think about uh, the kind of DNA we're looking for, right? So the proactive type of people that are willing to just take something on and, and, and go run with it. Um, so, you know, we're not the kind of company where, you know, we arrange everything for you. You just sit back and let it happen, right? You're in the driving seat. And I think that's also what, what's kept me within the company. Um, because I like that a lot, that, that autonomy and freedom and, uh, and productivity. That empathy is key as well. Um, not only, um, in, in working with our clients, right? Cause I think the professional services firms, you need to be able to truly understand what's going on, um, not only within your client's company, but in your client's minds, right? And what they feel, because otherwise we won't be able to truly under, truly help them, right? And, and support them. But that's on the client side, but also within the team, obviously. Um, we need to make sure that the teams we work with um, perform at their best. Um, and so therefore we need to understand them deeply, right? Understand their concerns, understand what makes them tick. Uh, so empathy is, is a key skill. 
Um, and then excellence, uh, I think it goes without saying, but that the, the types of services we offer um, uh, and yeah, I mean, the kinds of rates we, 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 we charge for those services really require everything to be right and excellent, right? So excellence is, is, is almost a, a qualifier, I would say, uh, but one of our very important values. Um, all right, so much about the values, uh, then about the London office specifically, right? Our business focus. Um, so we do three types of works, basically. Corporate strategy, strategy delivery, and investor support or, or uh, private equity. Um, let me briefly describe each of those three, and then I can give you some examples. So corporate strategy is really trying to help a company as to, you know, what should we be doing? In which direction should the company develop? What kind of markets should we go after? What kind of capabilities do we have? Can we monetize those capabilities in a different way than we've been doing today? Is there maybe a disruptor um, in, in our market? How should we respond, right? So that's really sort of like deciding what the direction of the company should be for the next five to 10 years or maybe even longer. Then the strategy delivery side, is very much if you've decided what the strategy for the company uh, should be, which direction you should develop the company into, then strategy delivery is really about making that happen, right? So what is the right organizational structure? What are the right incentives? What kind of procedures do we need? What kind of processes do we need in order to deliver that strategy and actually you know, make the company move into the direction that we decided in during the corporate strategy phase? Then investor support of private equity is very much focused on, um, uh, on basically the private equity uh, business model of buying a company at a relatively low price, making some improvements, uh, uh, buying some other companies to put on top, and then sell it at a higher price, right? So basically private equity is uh, buy low, sell high, right? <laughs> and do something in between to make that happen. Um, what we predominantly focus on in investor support is the due diligence, uh, which means basically figuring out to what extent uh, the commercial prospects for the company are sensible uh, and therefore justify uh, the price uh, to sell it for or to buy it at, depending on who we work for, for the selling side or for, for the buy side. Um, now, let me dive a little bit into these three uh, categories. So in terms of corporate strategy, um, we tend to say we have a STEM bias. Um, that has been true, I think, until recently, <laughs> uh, because we're also adding other strings to our bow. Um, but, you know, I have an engineering background. We do a lot of uh, aerospace and defense. Um, uh, we do uh, electronics. We do engineering services. We do life sciences. So all those kinds of things have so sort of like an engineering science kind of kind of background. Um, automotive as well, uh, but we're also developing consumer goods and retail. Um, uh, we're, we're, we have the ambition to build into TMT as well. Um, so that standby is, is something that I think that is true for the majority of the business right now, but there's definitely an ambition to, um, uh, to expand that. Um, then, yeah, some, some examples. So we've done a sustainability strategy uh, for global logistics company. And this was really a trailblazer. Like they were the first mover based on, on that sustainability strategy. And as a result, all the other players in that industry had to move uh, as well. And I think this has only been accelerated by COVID. Um, uh, so, so a key piece of work. Uh, also, I think this is probably the right time to introduce um, one of our uh, platforms. So... We've been working on our corporate strategy ourselves as well. And we do feel that, you know, with the European heritage and being able to sort of like work across those cultures, get to agreement across all those cultures and different interests, uh, we're very well positioned um, uh, to, uh, yeah, to, to, to provide uh, uh, sustainability consulting, right? So we have the knowledge, other people have the knowledge as well, but we also have I think, the stakeholder value view, uh, which I think many of our competitors lack. Uh, and as a result, one of our key platforms within this corporate strategy is the sustainability strategy. And this is like all encompassing, right? So this is uh, waste management. Um, uh, this is on the agricultural side. This is uh, aircraft electrical propulsion. This is obviously automotive, uh, electric vehicles, uh, uh, hydrogen. Um, so there's, there's a whole sort of like uh, uh, spectrum of, of, of topics we're, co we're covering here. Um, then, yeah. 
two brief things on strategy delivery and investor support, just to give you a feel for, for, for the kind of projects. Uh, so in strategy delivery, we've designed a target operating model for, uh, for an aerospace and defense company. Uh, so this aerospace and defense company had grown through many acquisitions. Um, and as, but those acquisitions, like those acquired companies and sites, had always been operating the way uh, they were used to. So as a result, you know, some customers could have 14 different contracts with 14 different sites who would perform completely differently. So some were top-notch, some, some weren't. Um, and when there was an issue, right, they had to figure out which one of the sites they had to go to. So you can see this is like pretty complex. We redesigned their target operating model to make sure there was one single point of contact for that customer for the entire company. Uh, making sure that they started working according to the same times of processes, um, making it much more uh, efficient and effective um, and way less complexity for everyone involved, right? So customers, employees, uh, shareholders, and suppliers. Um, and then on investor support, as mentioned, right, the due diligence, which is basically, um, you know, doing your homework on a company to figure out, you know, whether the growth that's being presented in the business plan uh, is actually plausible or not. So typically we look at, you know, what the market development is, um, what the customer relationships of this company is, the competitive positioning, and, you know, whether those customer relationships and competitive position actually justify a market share gain or a market share loss for that company. So is it growing above or, or below the market to understand the, uh, the, the potential or the plausible revenue of that company? Um, I think I've... Uh, I've, I've already, uh, this has been a, a way too long monologue. So I think it's time for me to hand over. <laughs> ah, no, one last point. Digitalization as announced, right? In the, the knowledge technology capital thing, tech is key. Um, and we have decided internally, and I think rightly so, uh, that we cannot be the expert on everything, right? Um, so I think what we are experts in strategy development experts in strategy delivery. Um, many of our competitors have tried building the whole digitalization bit uh, within their own company. Uh, but that means that they're always lacking. They will always be lacking uh, new insights and other things. And what we've set up is Terra Numerata, which is uh, a partnership with more than 90 external partners, which allows us to mix and match basically, right? So based on what we see our clients need uh, in our strategy projects and our strategy delivery projects, we can source the right partner, right? And so there is no incentive for us to push our own team or push a specific team. We can pick and choose whichever partner is the best suited um, uh, to, to deliver uh, the solution for, for the client's problem. Um, all right. Thank you, Kai. Hardy. Yeah. Um, I've just realized I'm unable to share my screen I don't know if David, if you're able to edit my admin view, if possible. I'm not able to, but um, if whoever's on the future conference too, should be able to make you um, a co-host. Okay. So I'll just, okay, I think it's just worked. Thank you. Can everyone just give me a thumbs up if they're able to see my screen? Yeah, I think. Perfect. Okay, so um, hi everyone. So as I mentioned previously, my name's Hardeep and I'm the HR manager in the London office. I'm just going to dive into a bit of detail um, regarding our current opportunities and what the development process looks like at Roland Berger um, and dive into a bit of our culture as well. Start. One moment, apologies, I'm having some. There you go. Okay, so in terms of development programs and what the offering is, um, we have a kickoff program, which is basically a two week long program um, that you would go on as a junior consultant, which offers you with all of the fundamental skill sets to set you up um, as a consultant. So this particular program actually takes place in Germany. Historically, this year, we've had some challenges because of COVID. But um, it really immerses you into our German culture, gives you the opportunity to meet with other consultants um, on a global basis. 
and um, you'll have the opportunity to really network and um, go on various social events and activities as well as getting um, all of the fundamentals in terms of training. We also have a challenge club, which is basically for our top performers. And this again is a global initiative. So typically um, every office within Roland Berger nominates a couple of top performers to be a part of this challenge club. Um, and again, this uh, provides you with different trainings and the opportunity to network on a global remit with other country top performers. We also have active mentoring and coaching on the job. So from day one, you would have um, an allocated mentor that would go through a development plan with you um, and ensure that you get all of the right support upon joining. As Kai mentioned, um, a lot of our projects are international. So there's the opportunity to also um, get staffed on an international remit as well as being based in London. So we'll go back to um, the entrepreneurial element, as this is really fundamental um, and what differentiates us in terms of, uh, you know, com comparing us to other consultancies. So at Roland Berger, we say, you know, that you, we want you to really take your career into your own hands and um, drive it in the direction that you want to. So um, if that's from um, a kind of a sector specialism that you want to eventually end up in, or perhaps it's a course that you want to do or something that um, comes to mind that you, know, you want to um, bring to the table, as Kai mentioned, we have an extremely flat structure in the London office. So senior management is very accessible and we really want you to have the drive um, to make things happen essentially in the office. Work-life balance. Um, so I can see this says opportunities to work from home at the moment. Obviously, in COVID times, everyone is situated at home. But uh, on a longer term remit, we do value um, all of our consultants having a good work-life balance and have various models um, in order to support this. So family oriented support, opportunities to work from home. Um, we have coaching sessions that specifically focus on stress management. And twofold to that, we also have uh, various uh, activities that happen throughout the year. So sporting events or just social activities in the London office specifically, we have um, what we call Super Fridays, which takes place on the last Friday of every month where the business um, buys lunch for everyone and then takes us out um, to a nearby venue in the evening. So um, just having that uh, time to really connect with one another outside of work um, is fundamental really to um, enabling the team to connect. Yeah, and Ari, maybe if I if I may jump in there on the, because yeah. uh, it, it's at a point like very close to my heart, right? So yeah. in the 19th century, you know, we, we were working in factories and, you know, if you, if you make 10 boxes in eight hours, you can make 20 in 16 hours. That's not quite how it works. It, this job right because it's a knowledge intensive knowledge driven job so you need downtime you need downtime in order to be productive during uptime right mm. and um I, I think in my personal situation so i have uh, i have a son who's five year old and a daughter who's four year old uh when they were born i took two months off to spend with them right uh, in both on both occasions and also every day i make sure that you know i drop them off at school uh, and or before that at nursery and, and I pick them up or I cook at home and we just have dinner with the whole family, right? So however busy I am, uh, that just always happens every day, right? Um, and I think it's important to, to emphasize that because I think a lot mm. of people may not see the possibility, right? But you, you just have to do with an institutionalize it basically. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kai. Um, it's good to have a, an actual real life example of that. And um, as I mentioned, you know, we would do our utmost best really to um, support you, whatever your circumstances be, be it kind of from a family perspective, or if you're feeling particularly stressed and you need some downtime, it's an extremely open um, culture within the London office. Okay, so international opportunities. Um, so we have various transfer opportunities at Roland Berger. So we have shorter term transfers. So if you wanted the opportunity to go abroad for between three to six months, we can arrange for that to happen um, with one of our offices. And then we also have longer term transfers where you have the opportunity to move to a new location for between one and a half years and five years. As Kai mentioned, um, he previously worked in the Amsterdam office and has been situated in London now for about seven years. And we also have my colleague, Nick Hill, who was previously based in the Boston office and Capucine, um, who previously worked in the Madrid office. 
So to go into a bit of detail um, and give you a brief overview of our actual recruitment process. So we have one live role at the moment, which is our junior consultant role. Um, the application deadline for that role is Sunday, the 25th of October. And if you're successful at the screening phase, um, we would invite you through for a testing day. Now, historically, this test has actually taken place um, in our offices or on various campuses, but we're in the process of um, implementing that into a virtual format. And uh, it's essentially an analytical test that's about half an hour long um, and is very similar in format to the GMAT test. So um, if you're successful at that testing phase, um, there's two rounds of case-based interviews. So the first uh, round of case-based interviews, you can expect them to take place in November. And um, the final round of case-based interviews will take place in late November, um, early December. So in terms of the other role that we're hiring for at the junior consultant level, it's our junior consultant inter internship role. And um, that vacancy is yet to go live. So the opening date for that vacancy is Monday, the 30th of November. And the closing deadline is Sunday, the 10th of January. So this um, particular role is exactly has exactly the same process in terms of um, if you're successful at screening, you get invited to an analytical test. And then there's two rounds of case based interviews, except for the timeline is just slightly later on in the year. And the actual internship um, takes place summer 2021, and it's an eight week long internship. OK, we'll wrap up now with them. Um, answering some of your questions. So thank you all for your time um, and looking forward to engaging with you um, and any questions you may have. David, have we had many questions We've come not had through? We've any questions yet, but I'll start oh. off with us. I'll start off by first saying thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, and so you said previously that um, you support people in um, doing kind of courses and stuff if they want to. Yeah. Um, does that include stuff as deep as a PhD? So PhDs, and um, we don't actually offer sponsorship for, but we do offer sponsorship for MBAs. So that could be a possible alternative. And um, from kind of, uh, on, as a side note, we are open to actually listening to any trainings that someone has externally sourced. So as an example, we actually had one of our consultants that wanted to um, learn Mandarin earlier this year, and um, we're, we supported her to do that. So um, we're quite flexible, really, in terms of uh, what trainings, you know, both from an internal and external perspective, people have sourced. Here we go. We've got some questions now. So... Um... Someone asks, can students from any year apply to these roles? No. So for the internship program, typically we receive a lot of uh, applications from students in their penultimate year of study because they want that exposure within the consulting um, world ahead of making a final decision. And they also have the opportunity to secure a permanent role once they've graduated. But we also have a lot of students um, apply for the internship role that are in their final year of study. Um, and for the junior consultant role, that has a start date of around September 2021. So you would have to be in your final year of study to apply for that role because um, it would be a full time start kind of end of next year. Wonderful. Also, um, and we've got another question, which is, um, are the interviews this year going to be conducted virtually? They will be indeed. So we all have teams now and we're all becoming more and more um, or well, better really with using t the Teams format. Um, so what would happen is if you're invited to interviews, the your interviewer would share a link with you just to join the meeting. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, um, we don't have many people going into the office at the moment. So uh, it will be virtual interviews this year. And sort of a follow-up question kind of, um, do you provide tier two visa sponsorship? Or we do indeed, yeah, we do. Um, so a lot of the London office, actually, we have um, a lot of internationals. So um, and we want to have a, and promoted having a diverse workforce. So this is why we, we offer sponsorship. Perfect, wonderful. Um, I guess on the same um, page as the interview process, 
Um, so Max asks, uh, how can we prepare for the psychometric testing? So, as I mentioned, it's very similar to the GMAT test. And if you are invited to the actual interviews, we'll give you some more information um, in terms of, you know, what you can do to prepare. But I'd say um, as a first step, I mean, it's an analytical test. So um, have a look really online for resources that you can leverage from and just do as many practice tests as you can. So if you're if you're invited, we actually share a practice test with you to give you a better idea of the format and how it's structured. Wonderful. You want another one? Um... Can final year undergraduate students apply for summer internships or only penultimate year students? So you, you are eligible to apply if you're a final year or penultimate year. So we had um, one of our interns that joined us uh, in the internship program last summer and then joined us at, uh, on a full-time remit from October. So very quick turnaround. Yeah, Hardy, but just add to that as well. I think, so I was um, someone who had an internship and joined straight away afterwards. Mm. And at the time, I think it was actually, um, it's, it's definitely quite a good um, process to go through because you can basically just start straight away. And I think a lot of other places didn't really offer that. Um, Flexibility, that yeah. You didn't really have an internship in your, in your final year and then start straight away. But it's definitely enjoyable for me. Thank you, Alexi. Wonderful. Um, also, are cover letters necessary and what are you looking for in them? Definitely. Um, so cover letters really is what will make your profile stand out. As you can imagine, we receive a vast amount of applications which have very strong academics. So your cover letter will actually give you the opportunity to really go into detail as to why you've chosen Roland Berger, um, why you think that you'll be successful in consulting and what you've done to date to pursue a career in consulting. So I recommend um, getting involved in extracurricular activities. If you um, have access to consulting societies or entrepreneurial societies to really then um, highlight to us, you know, what you've done in addition to your academics um, to pursue a career in consulting. Awesome. Um, also on that application front, are the applications rolling or are they all kind of considered uh, equally? So they are um, screened on a rolling basis. Um, so kind of uh, less of an application sort of logistic thing, but uh, someone asked, as Roland Berger is more focused on aerospace and manufacturing sectors, does it mean that you'll have to have preference towards graduates from engineering majors or, all, or are all majors welcomed? All majors are, are welcomed. Um, so we don't actually target a specific um, discipline. And um, I, when you join, you actually join as a generalist. So um, you get the opportunity to get exposure in different industries, different project types. And it's only when you're really at that project manager level that you start to specialize in a particular topic. And maybe um, a few of the consultants that we have on the line can go into detail about their academic background and what they found themselves doing at Roland Berger. Maybe Nikhil. <laughs> if he's still, is Nikhil Yeah, still sorry, I was, yeah. Just, I was just taking myself off mute, absolutely. So um, just to give you um, a, quick, a quick example. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm an aerospace engineer. Um, so, you know, when I came in, uh, thinking I, I want to get into consulting. Um, yeah, I thought maybe I'd do an aerospace project or two, but it, it was by no means all I wanted to, to actually get involved in. And I've been very lucky from that perspective. So I actually started my career uh, doing a lot of uh, projects in chemicals, in automotive. Um, I even did some projects in software. There was one in which we looked at baby prams um and 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 the market and the market for strollers and things like that so it is really a very eclectic mix of of, of work that you will find here however as hardy mentioned as you kind of get more and more senior over time uh you have more opportunities to specialize so ultimately i did decide having sampled all of these different these different sectors and and learn a lot more, to be honest. Um, I decided I do want to continue in aerospace. And now I, I tend to focus on aerospace and aviation. 
but also dip my toe in um, into, into automotive and chemicals uh, whenever the opportunity comes along. So it, it really is um, something that's within your control and it really fits in with our entrepreneurial um, mindset, I would say, uh, that not only can you, can you sample these different industries, but then also specialize over time if you wish. Yeah, and maybe maybe to add to that, uh, I remember in Amsterdam, uh, one of our colleagues uh, had studied the conservatory violin, right? Um, and she brought like great creative insights that you know the engineers would never have brought. So I think it's it's especially this diversity we're looking for. Um, mm. And similarly, I mean, I've been in like in financial services, like restructuring banks on Cyprus and things like that, right? Uh, I, I didn't have any clue about financials or things like that, but uh, it's just, I think what we're looking for is really like bright people with like creative ideas, um, you know, that can help us deliver the, the kind of insights we're looking for. So from my point of view, there is no like preferred background. Uh, mm. you know. yeah. Wonderful. That's very interesting. We've got some more questions now. So, um, uh, so how is Roman Berger different from other consulting firms? I mean, apart from obviously everything that's been mentioned. Well, I think for me, well, I, I, again, I think the entrepreneurship bit is, is really important. Um, another, I think, very important uh, aspect for me, um, also at the time when I was basically making my choice for an internship, because I also did an internship with Roman Berger, um, is the... That, challenger position, right? So we are not the largest global consulting organization, but what that means is that you can build one, right? It is much more fun to build and make something grow and make it bigger every day than it is to try to make sure you retain your market share and retain like the biggest elephant in the room, remain the biggest elephant in the room, right? Um, and that also translate through, translates through to opportunities within the company. Right, uh, because if if you're trying to so like keep your market share and keep the size of your company up, it means there are a limited amount of opportunities for senior positions, right? Because everyone just stays there. Whereas if you're growing rapidly, you're basically pulling people up through the pyramid, um, you know, to get them to those senior positions because you need them because the company is growing so quickly, right? Um, so I think that's another uh, very interesting aspect to me uh, about the, about our company on top of the entrepreneurship, uh, which I won't belabor any anymore, but I, I truly do believe. Yeah, just to add to that as well, Kai, I think um, speaking to a couple of my friends who've worked for different consulting firms uh, in London, I think on the softer side, it's actually, uh, we, have, we have a nice balance between kind of a relatively small London office in terms of like 60 uh, consultants or so and then still having that global picture so you know you can you will know everyone in the office but still you have the opportunity to uh, go abroad and and go to, to projects in other countries which I think is, is is kind of the right balance rather than having maybe you know, if, if you don't want 500 people in an office that you don't know a lot of Yeah, I would just add something super quickly. I would say that in addition, as a junior uh, consultant especially, since Rollenberger is maybe a bit less structured and a bit less processed uh, than the big American ones, you are very likely to be very exposed uh, very quickly. Uh, and I think this is something that uh, is really important as a, as a junior or as an analyst in general. It just kept saying just for, for our understanding, you mean exposed to clients from the exactly. Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Um, we've got another question, which is um, if you were to go back to a time when you were an undergraduate student um, about to like start your career, what advice would you give to yourselves? It's an interesting one. I think uh, I think I would actually give my my younger self the advice, uh, yeah, w what I've done, right? So uh, I, again, I'm I'm speaking here from my so like mechanical engineering background, but I think in engineering, typically either you you know dive deep into the engineering world or you look beyond, right? And for me, the reason I started um, uh, studying engineering is because I like 
I like the, the content challenge, right? So really like thinking deeply about problems and, and solving them. What I didn't like about like an engineering uh, career is that it's just the content, right? So there, there is not really a social challenge. Uh, whereas in consulting, I could find both, right? I could find the challenging content. I could always learn about anything I like uh, at the pace I like. But at the same time, there is a, an important social challenge as well, which gets bigger and bigger, like the more uh, senior positions you get, right? So first of all, is uh, as a junior consultant, you need to make sure that the analysis is correct, that you're doing the right analysis, you know, that everything is perfect and it's excellent. Um, but the more senior you get, you get into a meeting with people who will disagree with you and your job is to make them agree with, you know, what the right answer is. Uh, and that is, that is a social challenge. Uh, and that is difficult, but very rewarding when it works. Uh, so my advice would be, um, first of all, do a bit of soul searching, right? What makes you happy? Um, I think that's very important. Not just focus on things that, you know, you, uh, you think you need to be good at, right? But just things you really love doing. Because I think spending your time on something you love doing is, is much more worth it in life than trying to correct things you're not that good at. Um, so I think that's one. A and also test it out, right? So I did an internship in engineering. I did an internship in consulting. Um, and that really provides you with the, uh, with the insight I think you need to, to make a proper decision. I'll add, I'll add one more thing to that, if that's all right. So um, taking a slightly different um, glint to the question. Um, I think if I could advise myself when I was an undergrad, I'd say, speak your mind and take more risks. I think it's it's quite natural for, for undergrads or, or recent graduates to come into new jobs or, or, or go into internships and, and, and be there thinking they're here to learn and, and everyone around them knows more than them. But that's not necessarily always true. The reason, the reason we've given you that job, if you, if, you, if, you, if you do get the offer, is because we want to hear your perspective. We want to hear your views. And I think if only everyone would share their views respectfully and constructively more, I think we'll get to the right answer, as Kai mentioned, more frequently and, 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 and quickly and more quickly as well. And so the advice there is don't, don't hide. Don't don't think that your opinion doesn't count. In fact, speak up and, and take and take that risk uh, because not only will you um, be, be sharing your, your perspective, which I'm sure will be a good one, but furthermore, you might, you'll actually be heard. Um, and, that's, and that's good for everyone. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, so another question back to internships. Um, Someone asks, are internships rotational in terms of between corporate strategy, strategy delivery, and pirate equity, investor support? Uh, can you indicate preference for sector, for sector specialisms within this as well? Yep. So I'll, ask, I'll answer the second question first. Um, so in terms of do we take preferences into account? Most definitely. So ahead of starting your internship with us, we would ask you if you have a particular preference, but we can only really um, ensure that you get staffed on that preference if there's an influx in, of a, proj a particular project that aligns with your preference. So yes, we do take preference into consideration, but we can't guarantee that you will receive um, exposure uh, in relation to that particular preference, because we can't predict what projects are coming in. And then to answer your first question, um, typically interns rotate on a couple of different projects. So as I mentioned, it's an eight week long internship program. And um, depending on what project you're staffed on, um, you would get the opportunity to uh, get staffed on maybe one or two projects. Um, I think we have Alexi who interned with us. Perhaps you can go into a bit of detail about the sort of projects that you were staffed on, Alexi, when you were interning. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think when I was interning, which seems like a long time ago now, actually, um, I, I was on two projects, four weeks each. Um, one was on intellectual property rights. And then the other one, I think, was um, actually uh, aviation related. So actually quite a nice mix of uh, the, the work we did. 
Um, I think also within, just in, the, in between the two of them, I worked on a couple of, I worked on one acquisition pitch, which is trying to win uh, other projects. So I think that that actually gave quite a nice balance of the kind of work we do. And I, it definitely was taken into account, as I said, my, my preferences beforehand. Wonderful. Um, we've got another question, which is how has COVID impacted the supply and demand for consulting projects in the sectors that you all mainly operate in? Yeah, I think this is a very relevant question, obviously. Um, so uh, I think there, it, it really is a mix, right? So uh, aerospace uh, and aviation has been hard hit. Um, uh, definitely. Uh, on the private equity side of things, so the deals, uh, they, uh, I think the deals went quiet for a while uh, when there wasn't too much predictability on you know, what, it, what, what it was going to look like. Uh, you could argue that we still don't have the predictability, but the deals have come back. <laughs> uh, so uh, I guess there's just too much money slushing around within private equity funds uh, that they, they would like to invest. Um, so, but on the, for instance, on the other side in life sciences, there is loads of projects like, so within our, uh, life sciences, global life sciences practice, we're basically sold out. Um, and similarly on the restructuring end of things, right? So, um, especially in automotive, uh, I think the automotive OEMs, they already had a very tough time, uh, before COVID hit, um, uh, because the market in China slowed down, which was their main cash generator. And at the same time, they had to invest for electric vehicles, for shared mobility, for connected uh, and digitalization. So they needed a lot of cash to invest for the future, um, but they couldn't generate a lot. So that was already happening before COVID. Then COVID hit, um, which obviously impacted the automotive industry as well. So there's a lot of restructuring work there to be done in the, in, in the entire supply chain. Um, so it, it's really a mixed picture, um, dependent on the industry and, and, and the function, basically, uh, uh, of, of consulting that, that you're, you're strong at, right? Does that answer the question? question david or yeah no i think i'll like well. so i was looking for another question <laughs> okay yeah no, no worries <laughs> oh, i guess I'll, I'll ask a question then because I don't, I don't see any other questions um so how does when uh picking projects in roland burger um does the company um take into account um, like a sort of ethical um, stance to its projects. Mm -hmm. So just to explore that a bit more, just to make sure that I understand the, the question. So um, would we be assessing, you know, whether we feel it's ethically correct to help a client what they ask us? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we, we most certainly do, right? Um, and uh, there have there have been uh, multiple cases actually I've been involved in uh, where you know we went back to the client and said actually you know either we say like we don't feel we're best positioned right to help you do this or we say we don't think this is the right thing to do, right? Um, and obviously you know you may forego um, some short term revenue, but you know, uh, that, that is basically irrelevant. Uh, I think, you know, if these kinds of questions come in, come into play uh, and on top of that, even from a business point of view, um, right. Our professional services are sold based on trust, right? So you have to be a trusted advisor to, uh, to your client. And so a trusted advisor tells a client what he thinks. Um, based on what the client should be doing rather than, you know, what kind of project or revenue or whatever the, the consultant wants to make, right? So it is really about, so quite often, you know, we go back to the client and say, the question you're asking us, I don't think that's actually going to help you in the long term, right? Um, maybe we should not do this, but, you know, uh, look at this over the longer term or just not do it, right? Uh, because we don't feel it, it adds value. Um, so for me, I think it's it's very clear, right? Uh, what we can and cannot do, and and why. 
Wonderful, thank you very much. We do actually have uh, a couple more questions. Um, and I think maybe that will hopefully bring us to the end of um, what's been a very interesting um, and great talk. So first question is, um, as a final year undergraduate thinking of doing a master's, can you apply to both internship and full-time? You can indeed. There we go, wonderful, that, that answers it. <laughs> um, and then the second question is that there are two different rounds of case interviews. Um, and what is the difference between the two different rounds? So the first round would be typically with a project manager uh, within the London office. And then the final round takes place uh, with a partner and a principal. So when I say there's two rounds, it's actually two rounds of two case-based interviews. So in the first round, you get um, interviewed by two individuals. And in the final round, you get interviewed by two individuals. So a total of four case study interviews. Okay. And is there a difference in content? Um, so well, if, I mean, apart from the fact that obviously they're different cases. Yeah. Um, is there no, so it's, it's the same format for every interview, but... Uh, every individual would present you with a different case. Okay, that makes sense. Um, we've got another question, which is, what is the biggest challenge that awaits a person who's gonna move, who wants to move into consulting? The biggest hmm, challenge. Uh, yeah, I remember well, when I did an internship um, and then I took a train back home, I would just fall asleep in the train, right? It's just, so I, I would say, like the biggest challenge is to is like get up, get up to the speed that things are happening and that you're supposed to be thinking at, right? Um, I also remember vividly after I did the internship, I went back to the university to do my master's. I was like, come on, we can do this in like half the time, right? <laughs> so, but, but getting there, right? Getting at, to that speed. Uh, requires, I think, uh, quite a lot of, uh, I mean, that's my experience, right? Quite a lot of um, effort, uh, but when you get there, uh, it's great. Maybe we could have another example from a junior consultant. Yeah, if I can chip in for a bit, uh, actually building on what Kai just said, I, I guess that adaptability for me was key. So be able to, uh, within a matter of week or days, get uh, on board a topic uh, about which you know little about or nothing. Uh, I mean, that that's, seems challenging. You, you're feeling like, oh, how am I going to get around with this? But actually, you realize that you, you do. Um, you, you, you are being helped uh, in this manner. And I felt that this is really, in a way, uh, helping you to see diverse uh, industries and diverse setting in a short amount of time because you, can, you get to change a lot. So being able to adapt is actually, for me, key to fully grasp the benefit of uh, consulting. Just to add to that as well, even uh, three years after, Sorry, is, is Lucas still speaking? We can hear you. Uh, even uh, even three years after um, I, I've been at Rollenberg, still when I start on a new project within a new industry, I get the feeling at the beginning that I, I don't know anything at all. But, you know, just a day or two kind of going through the materials, talking to people who, who know their stuff, and you get you get caught up really quite quickly. Um, I think that's, that's something that you see, it seems like it's never going to improve, but it really does. Wonderful. Um, I think probably final question here. Um, so sort of like the question that we had before about what would you tell your undergraduate self? Um, sort of what is the one thing you'd wish somebody would have told you before you went into, like before you actually took the job, right? For me, it would be uh, that perception matters. <laughs> I think Kai uh, and Nika will attest to the fact that uh, my perception at the beginning potentially wasn't so good. So um, I think for me, it's, it's to, to be aware that, that you know, your, the way you conduct yourself and the way that you kind of present uh, your projects and, and your work is actually is incredibly important. And the way that people see kind of how hard you're working and how, um, I guess, uh, competent you are at, at your job.
Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm not. I mean, not entirely sure whether I agree with that, Alexi. Um, because I mean, and I, I am like, I don't like office politics or things like that. I'm way too Dutch, right, for that kind of stuff. Uh, so you know, my, my view is always like, if you do good work, you don't need to worry about the perception. <laughs> but uh, and don't get me wrong, I mean, you're doing great work. <laughs> I think that uh, might therefore you don't need to worry about the perception, <laughs> right? S sorry. I think that might have been the problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just. <laughs> um, but yeah, what's uh, mm, it's it's an interesting question, right? Uh, I I think maybe one of the things. Um, especially I think like in more senior positions, but it also trickles down, I think, um, is the unpredict potential unpredictability of the work, right? So it could be the case. So for instance, uh, like this morning, I was like uh, doing sports in the park um, and I came back and I had like 45 emails, like, like two or three projects and goals that, you know, I had to do today to start a project tomorrow. And while my day had already been like completely planned with other stuff. So it's that kind of stuff, right? Where you just mm -hmm. have to yeah, keep your head cool and say like, okay, there's only so much I can do. I can only prioritize. I cannot do everything at the same time. So, you know, what shall I do first? Um, and I think when you join, it's, you know, that that is much more structured by a project manager, like the types of tasks you're doing. Uh, so then, you know, that that is uh, to a certain extent easier. Um, but, you know, that is something that, yeah, to, to, that you just have to deal with or be able to deal with. Yeah. I'll add in one more, uh, one more thing, and I know we're getting to the end of our time here. Um, I think ultimately we, we always have to remember in our job that that we work for clients. We're not we're not doing this for for ourselves whatever it is that we're doing. And so the question that everyone should always in consulting uh, um, remember is, what does this mean for the client? Whatever we've learned today or whatever we've learned this week or whatever we've learned this hour, what's, what's really the insightful thing that we can then take to the client and, 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 and say, here's what it really means for your business. Here's what it really means for your situation or issue that you're facing. And I think if, if, if people come in remembering that ultimately our job is client service and that that's finally what we, what we really have to deliver is, is an insightful result that the client can then act on, um, it'll, it'll accelerate your, your, your path, let's say, to, um, to learning, uh, but also to, to delivering really good output. Um, so I think I, that's that. That would be my my one input for, for for anyone joining consulting. Remember that. Remember that you're doing it for a client, and they're interested in an insight. Wonderful. That's a great way to wrap it up. Um, thank you for uh, a wonderful talk. Um, there we go. Thank you. I'd just like to thank everyone for um, actually attending the presentation today and for engaging with us. If you have any questions that you think of um, offline, feel free to connect with myself or Veronica. The email address is recruitment at rolandberger.com. Great. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.